using this. Yeah, that looks good. Thank you. Okay. There we are. Uh, well, I showed the uh, cartoons of yesterday, of course. It was the second day, and it was the 5th of June. And it seemed to be World Environmental Day. Shouldn't it be every day an environmental day? Right. Probably that's where the problem started. Um, yeah, this, this was a nice uh, thing I, I saw yesterday. The yeah, science and practice um, going together upwards at the, uh, uh, the towards the sustainable oceans, and the aim is the ocean we need for the future we want. Yeah, the big ocean data talked about, and the question again: How big is the data? Which I think is a good question and a beautiful summary of our zeitgeist at the moment. And we need to think more about it. And then the disbalance. It might be about time for a shift of knowledge and research. About imperfect ecosystem knowledge. Um, it was too imperfect to inform management. Hey, no problem. The management ain't perfect neither. Hey, we look at the ecosystem model and there are no human decisions in it. And no tipping points, neither synergy, also no behavior switches. <laughs> ah, my model is my oyster. Nice, but can you please make a little place for these stakeholders? <laughs> and then getting the big picture, picture the global perspective, but not globally, but in detail. And then uh, I heard about the uh, use of body size by fish models. These models tend to become too skinny, which is, bad, uh, which is a bad role model for young fish. <laughs> and the question, please, more cooperation between modelers and observers. Blub, blub, bleep, bleep, bloop. Oh boy, there we have the fish robot, the fish robot. Well, we certainly passed the technolo technolo techni technological tipping point by now, which of course was not in our global fish model. <laughs> and here the global perspective, and nat natural science and social science try to keep it upwards, but a bit clumsy. And here we have tanks full of larvae. This was in one of the workshops. Hey, here it's too sour now. Well, here I miss a bit of acid. And here it's perfect now. Let's grow and reproduce. Science for uncertain future. More ice in the winter, Bering Sea means more fish. So since 40% of the American fishery depends on the Bering Sea, the increase of warming winters make our future pretty uncertain. Fishermen don't always follow the fish. Hey, there's where the fish are going. Yeah, but there's where we used to go. A, B, C. The A is for acceptance. The B for biological. The C for catches. The A, B, C seems often far higher than the actual catches. And then uh, I heard about the ensemble of models to improve results. And I thought about the confluence of uh, the day before. Hey, you know, for years about this warm blob here in the Pacific, why did, you, why did it take so long to work with us on this ramp? And most people know probably what a ramp is. It's a risk assessment and mitigation plan. Well, and the scientist in the boat says, you're totally right, we should research that. <laughs> and yeah, it's 2014 and we're at the West Coast. And there, uh, the warm blob is in the north, and El Nino in the south. And it's causing a sudden and extreme upwelling. 
But the cook said, ah, that's nice. A lot of anchovy and sardinas next year. But the other said, but we have less shrimps. Okay, then the workshop, ocean extremes and their impact. Expect the unexpected. I did not expect this. <laughs> Since it's so warm in here, I'll shift my diet. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, our air conditioning is getting worse and worse. And the air conditioning is the Bering Sea, of course. Hey, guys, it's get too hot here, I'm off. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. And the man says, oh, no. We have enough fish for today, we go home. Oh, no, considering my model, you should optimize your profits. Did you know we are the most traded commodity worldwide? Oh boy, always showing off. <laughs> Global fish consumption keeps increasing. Oh nice, more, more, more. And here is the higher temperature and they result in different reactions. Here's the cot, well I'm off, hasta la vista, and the haddock. Well, I feel totally fine now. Let's reproduce a bit extra, oh yeah. If models were reality, the probability of a fish please. Oh, great, we have lots of possible scenarios. I'll estimate a price for you. <laughs> and then numbers of lobsters were dropping, and that is a problem. Hey, stop that. And then the last one, the catastrophic transition. Uh, the case of the North Atlantic herring, catastrophic. I'd rather like to talk about a regime shift, sounds less negative. Mind your audience. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bas. And before I announce today's session and the plenary speakers, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Howard Broman, uh, the uh, Editor-in-Chief of the ICS Journal of Marine Science, and the Principal Research Scientist with the Institute of the Marine Research in Bergen, Norway. As you know, Dr. Broman's expertise spans a large range of topics, uh, including zooplankton and the interplankton behavior and ecology, recruitment mechanisms, effect of solar ultraviolet radiation and the ocean acidification on aqua aquatic organisms and ecosystems, aquaculture and the impacts of the aquaculture on marine ecosystems, and marine policy. Uh, he has had a long-standing interest and record of service in advancing scientific publications and addressing issues in scientific publication. Uh, serving as an editor of the many major international journals and serving on Council of the Science, Editors, and the commi Committees on Publication Ethics. He has been a champion for prior ECO4 proceedings uh, being published in the ISIS journal. So today, uh, he will I share information on the special symposium proceedings. So welcome, Dr. Broman. Thanks for that. Not quite as amusing as uh, Bas Kohler, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, while I'm here to spend about 10 minutes, uh, just giving you an update on the uh, uh, the IC's Journal of Marine Science and going through some of the nuts and bolts no, of uh, so submitting to uh, the symposium issue. There you go. So the, uh, the title slide gives you my objectives. So I won't spend any more time on that. And I'll start with some uh, history. In case some of you are not aware of the history of the IC's Journal of Marine Science, it's one of the oldest uh, marine science journals, perhaps one of the oldest scholarly journals. It uh, started publishing in 1903, 
Between 1903 and 1925, it was published as the IC's Publication de Circonstances, and since 1925 as the IC's Journal of Marine Science. So it's uh, 115 continuous years of publication. Um, I give uh, quite a few lectures on scientific publishing, and one of the things that I do in that lecture is ask people to raise their hand if they know the uh, names of uh, the editors-in-chief of uh, a list of journals that I typically put up on the slide. And when I first did this, well, I guess I was a little bit surprised to find that nobody knew who the editors-in-chief were. So I take the opportunity to put the table up here of uh, some names that uh, you might uh, know who have been the editor-in-chief of uh, the IC's Journal of Marine Science. I don't necessarily count myself in the list of names that you might know, but anyways, there it is. So um, the types of articles that the IC's uh, journal publishes are pretty standard. Uh, original research articles, reviews, uh, food for thought articles, and covatimus articles, food for thought, are just what they sound like, and they're intended to be a little bit provocative. It's better if they are a little bit provocative. Uh, gets debate going, and covatimus articles are kind of future-oriented, where people see the future of a field going. And comments and replies are typically uh, critiques of articles that have been published in the journal, and then the authors get a chance to respond to that critique. Um, in terms of the trajectory of submissions, uh, its date uh, on the x-axis and number of submissions on the y-axis, and you'll see uh, that we're around 600 submissions uh, per year, and uh, that this submission rate has doubled in the last 10 years. In terms of the geographical distribution of authors, uh, unsurprisingly, there are several uh, states, several countries that dominate, uh, not unsurprising ones, um, but the uh, number, the kind of range and number of uh, countries uh, from which we're receiving uh, submissions has increased uh, quite substantially in the last few years. In terms of the um, screening, editorial screening process that we run, it's called a dual editorial pre-screening system, which means that one or more editors evaluates every submission uh, upon receipt. Uh, that means that I read all 600 of those submissions, usually within not all on the same day, <laughs> within uh, two to three days of receipt. And if I can't make a uh, kind of preliminary editorial assessment of it myself, uh, I pass it on uh, to a topic editor to help me decide about it. And then the journal currently has 58 what we call empowered editors or decision-making editors. So this means that once the manuscript is assigned to a topic editor, uh, they have the authority to make a, an accept or reject decision over it. And uh, then my role becomes uh, overall supervision. So the uh, tracking of the uh, rejection rate for the journal, so it's year on the x-axis and the percent of submitted manuscripts that are rejected on the y-axis, you see a steep increase. And this is broken down into two components. So I indicated dual editorial pre-screening, so 40% of manuscripts submitted to the journal are uh, editorially rejected without being sent off for peer review, and 55% uh, of the manuscripts that uh, are reviewed are accepted. The uh, timing, kind of procedural timing for the journal, we're currently running at 40, a mean of 40 days from a receipt of your manuscript to first decision. And that's a real statistic. You may be aware that some journals, uh, well, in a way, fudge that statistic. They count it in a number of different ways, and it's actually longer than, uh, the, than the number that they give you. But in this case, this is the time from you clicking the submit button until you receive your decision. And then once a, the manuscript has been received in final form, uh, it takes about three to six weeks to appear online. For those of you that are, uh, well, interested in or care about the journal impact factor, uh, this is the trajectory of the journal impact factor for the journal, uh, the GIF on the y-axis and the year on the uh, x-axis. And uh, uh, well, a few of the competitors you could put up you could put up uh, quite a large number of, of journals, but uh, there you see the trajectory. Um, for those of you that 
want to see this in a bigger picture. I think this is a, maybe a better way to present this. This is a log log plot of all the journals that you will find in the web of science uh, with, uh, with the log of the number of journals uh, on the x-axis that have the impact factor log of the impact factor on the y-axis. It's a busy slide, but the takeaway message are that 80% of journals have impact factors below 1.4. 20% have impact factors between 1.4 and 1. Point, uh, and 17. So the, this places the IC's Journal of Marine Science in the top 15 to 20% of all scholarly journals. And then 0.3% have impact factors above 17. So for those of you in the audience that are all intending to submit your manuscripts to those, go buy a lottery ticket. Another, I think, uh, telling statistic to look at in terms of the interest in the journal is the, the number of article views. That's what you see here. So it's PDF and HTML views uh, by year, and you see a very substantial increase uh, in the number of articles being viewed uh, on the journal's website. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's a very healthy sign. So about submitting to the symposium issue, um, when you submit, if you do intend to submit, connect your work to the symposium's main themes. Do that in your cover letter and spend some time in your cover letter uh, telling us about uh, what you think is great <laughs> about the work um, and why we should be interested in it. Of course, submit online and uh, you'll reach a point in the online submission process where you can uh, select from a pull-down menu uh, this symposium, so please do that. And suggest an editor. We have, as I said, 58 editors, a wide range of uh, expertise. And, uh, you know, take a look at the list and choose somebody that you think uh, would be able to uh, do your manuscript justice in terms of a well-informed uh, assessment process. Um, on the journal's instructions to authors page, you'll find a document that's called How to Get Published in the IC's Journal of Marine Science. Um, I encourage you to look at that because it'll give you some sense for um, the decision-making process behind both the editorial pre-screening and the peer review assessment process. Uh, the deadline for submissions uh, is the 3rd of September. Um, as a general rule, we give a grace period. I'm not gonna tell you exactly what the maximum grace period is. That's a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> So shoot for the 3rd of September. Of course, uh, you can submit at any time before the 3rd of September as well. Uh, we all work to deadline, but if you're ready to submit, there's nothing preventing you from submitting today. And uh, the expected publication date of the issue is November 2019. But of course, uh, it's built on an article-by-article -article basis, as is the case in scientific publishing today. So. Um, Basically, when your article is ready, it'll go up online. It'll be tagged as being part of this symposium issue. Uh, we're lucky to have uh, quite a few of our uh, editorial boards uh, here uh, with us. Uh, Jason Link, uh, Silvana Birkino, uh, Mary Hunsaker, Robert Blasiak, uh, Stefan Plurd, um, and Manuel Hidalgo are all here. Uh, of course, I'm here, so uh, if you have any questions about uh, the publication, about publishing in the journal, general questions, please uh, uh, do a meet and greet with any of us or more than one of us, and we'll be happy to uh, discuss uh, your article with you. So thanks for listening, and if you have any questions, I'm around. Thank you, Dr. Bruma. So now uh, we would like to uh, introduce uh, today's uh, very interesting sessions. And uh, session 14 uh, is a vulnerability and adaptation of the marine socio-ecological systems to climate change, uh, which is convened by Drs. Jon Schmitz, Katarina uh, Franco Santos, and Cassie Mills. So they will focus on the question, how do we assess vulnerability and uh, adapt to changing marine systems. 
and session 15 is a fisheries and aquaculture in the face of global climate change. Current actions identified solutions and opportunities in support of sustainable livelihoods and food security, which is convened by Drs. Lena Westland, Hassan Mastafit, Anthony Charles, uh, Ratanana uh, Chuang Fatudi, and the Sir uh, Bernalis, uh, Florence uh, Polen, Mikhail Rast. And they will focus on the question, what are the best practices, tools, and innovative approaches to support sustainable livelihoods and food security needs? Session 10 uh, is the management and the conservation of species on move, which is convened by Charles Stock, Wendy Morrison, Thomas Territoriat, uh, Samasa Twinem, and Shinichi to myself. And they will focus on the question, how do we understand and respond to shifting species distributions with changing oceans? A session four is a deoxidation in global ocean and coastal waters in relation to climate change, which is uh, convened by Drs. Dennis Gilbert, Nancy Labarais. And they will focus on the question, how is deoxidation changing? What are future projections? And what does this mean for marine and coastal ecosystems? Uh, this is the last session. So uh, session 18 is a coastal ecosystem and their blue carbon science, conservation, and policy progress. Uh, Combiners uh, Yon Ramos, uh, Casting Essency, Dorothy Hall, and uh, uh, they focus on the issues, uh, recent advances in science and conservation regarding coastal blue carbon, the sequest uh, sequestration of CO2 by coastal ecosystems, uh, such as mangrove, tidal marshes, and seagrasses, meadows. Uh, this is a post session, so today's evening, Many interesting posters regarding on this session will be shown. And also last day, we have a plenary talk on this session. So we have a, a very exciting session today. And thank you again for all session conveners for organizing this kind of the very interesting sessions. And thank you again for all the participants and the contributions to this, these sessions. <clears throat>